Biblical Insights with Bob. Tonight we're going to continue our look at Isaiah 60. Isaiah is a very special book in these days. And so I'd like to finish out the concluding chapters, which I hadn't done before. Last week, last lesson, we looked specifically at uh, verses 1 to 9 of this chapter. And uh, we pointed out, Isaiah probably saw this as a, as a panoramic view. In other words, he didn't have a timeline which placed all the events he saw in chronological order. Now, remembering that Isaiah prophesied during the Babylonian captivity, some of the prophecies may have been fulfilled by the returning and rebuilding of the temple during that period, uh, undoubtedly some during the coming of Jesus the Messiah, and some possibly during the times of the Gentiles, which were the times between uh, the destruction of the second temple and uh, the final coming of the Lord for the Messianic age. So last time I gave a few examples. Uh, some scholars saw several of his prophecies as being fulfilled, listen to this, during our lifetime. Even in the verses we're looking at today, I kind of sense that we're seeing the beginnings of some of them even now. However, it's true that some of them can only be fulfilled in the millennium. That is the days when Jesus comes back and reigns in Jerusalem. Now, remember that Isaiah was writing to Jewish people, but in the days prophesied, especially in the times of the Gentile, it will include the church. Paul mentions that we have been grafted in in uh, the book of Romans. So anyway, it includes us, but it's written to the Hebrew people. So let's look, and we're beginning with verses 10 through 12. God says through Isaiah, foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I will have compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually They'll not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will utterly be ruined. Now, as we read this, we certainly have to say we're not there yet. And yet, if we look at what's happened today, I think we can see beginnings of what's written here. Now, for example, look at how many nations have already moved their embassy to Jerusalem or are planning to do so since President Trump has moved ours. And those nations now that are showing support for in Israel. In fact, I just read the news yesterday of a treaty that's been signed. So, but anyway, I believe that this final version that we're looking at now will be during the millennium and beyond. But again, we're looking at the overall prophecy here. Now, quoting Jeffrey Grogan now, he says, throughout much of her history, Jerusalem has been subject to assault from foreign enemies. It was the foreigners, the Babylonians, who destroyed her walls, and other foreigners, later the Romans, do it again. Like other Near Eastern cities, Jerusalem's gates would have been shut every night as a protection from sudden attack. Now, all this reflected the judgment of her God, the judgments that were so often upon her. Now, in the prophecy, she would have be the object of his grace. Jerusalem would receive both the service and the wealth of the nations and their monarchs, and no opposition to her would even be tolerated by her God. And a fulfillment of this after the exile, 
Isaiah prophesied was only partial. The Persians made possible the rebuilding of the walls, uh, but they didn't do it themselves. It's true fulfillment. It's beyond the Old Testament era altogether. And so the picture shown in this chapter paints a picture that's obviously in the future. For since the destruction of the second temple in AD 70, none of these prophecies spoken here have been true right up until the present time. So let's continue reading. He says, The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, the cypress together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. The sons who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Now, verse 13 speaks of a scene kind of reminiscent of the building of Solomon's temple, when the ruler, remember the ruler of Lebanon set supplies, including trees, to beautify the temple, the dwelling place of God. Picture that today. But Isaiah is showing us what will happen in the future. Now, note again in verse 14 that hasn't happened even our day. Those who afflicted Israel will submit themselves to her, recognizing Jerusalem the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. That, uh, to me, has to be pointing to the Millennial Kingdom. Now let's look at verses 15 and 16. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. You will also suck the milk of the nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now, again, we can see these prophecies which haven't come to pass at this time. Although maybe we can see some signs if we look closely. For example, I've just read recently in the last week or so, where Egypt is now standing with Israel in some of their battles. Now, I want you to look at verse 16 where it speaks of sucking the milk of nations and kings. When you first read that, even when it says sucking the breast of kings, it brings pictures that just don't seem realistic. Now, I like the words of J.A. Alexander's commentary where he says this, All interpreters agree in applying this to the influx of wealth and power and whatever else the kings of the nation's earth can contribute to the progress of the true religion. The figure is derived from Deuteronomy 33.9, and there it says, they shall suck the abundance of the seas. Now, note this, the catechesis in the second clause is not a mere rhetorical blunder. That which he's talking about there is where he says they shall suck the breast of kings. It's an example of some sense of overmastering the style, a license, the occasional use of which is characteristic of a bold and energetic writer. In other words, he goes a little beyond comparison. In fact, I looked up the word catachresis, and the definition is also known as an exaggerated comparison between two ideas or objects, an exaggerated. So that's what uh, Alexander is suggesting, that sucking the milk is an exaggerated comparison. I think the point is what the word of sucking the breast alludes to. 
it alludes to feeding of the baby. It's not a sexual thing, it's a matter of sustaining a baby by its mother. Through this action, the child is sustained and nurtured. So my thinking is that through this metaphor, it suggests Israel, and that includes us, the church, will now be sustained and supported by those who once persecuted her. Uh, there's a powerful thought there which really think about it. Sustained by those who persecute it. Now, while this obviously points to the millennial kingdom, it's interesting to me that we might seem to be, be seeing the beginnings of it now. And remember it said it would suck from the riches of the sea it's interesting because of the new discovery of gas and oil deposits in Israel, in the property of Israel, and that Israel is now being asked to supply gas to the nations or kings. This is particular interesting in view of Dr. Alexander's reference to Deuteronomy 33.9 where he talked about sucking the riches of the sea. So you see, some of these prophecies, we might be seeing some of glimpses or preludes to what's coming in the millennium. So let's read a couple more verses, 17 and 18. He says, instead of bronze, I'll bring gold, and instead of iron, I'll bring silver, and instead of wood, bronze, and instead of stones, iron. I will make peace your administrators and righteousness your overseers. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Now, once again, I looked to Dr. Alexander for his comments on this verse. He mentions first that the conditions mentioned here go from good to better, not from bad to good. Uh, I, I, I think that's important. Then, more importantly, he suggests that he's, this is not referring to money, but moral advantages meaning, and here's his quote, Magistry, government, here put for those who exercise it, like the nobility, the ministry, and other terms in English, which is commonly a bad sense. But here, used for magistrates and rulers in general, for the purpose of suggesting, now here it is, that instead of tyrants or exactors of the people should now be a more equitable government. You notice he says, I will make peace your administrators and righteousness your overseers, not persecution. Instead of tyrants and exactors, the people should now be under equitable government. Now, certainly this hasn't been seen in my lifetime. Again, I think it refers again to the Millennium Kingdom. But let's look at the final verses of this chapter. I like these. No longer will you have sun for light by day, nor for the brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor your will, will, will your moon wane, for you'll have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over, that all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it, in its time. What a glorious prophecy for Israel. All believers who are part of God's kingdom are included here. Now, probably the best way to 
complete the comments on this chapter and on these words in particular is to quote a couple of verses from Revelation. First of all, Revelations 21:23 said, And the city has no need of sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the lamp. Praise the Lord. We're looking at a time when he himself, I, I, it reflects back to me uh, the, uh, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, uh, the, the light that went before the Israelites in the desert and lit up the night and protected them. And then let's look at Revelations 22, 5. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have the need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Wow, that's what's ahead for God's people. Aren't you, aren't you happy that God has predicted this? God has told us this is coming for his kingdom. It's there. And so, folks, when we look at prophecy, it's too easy to look at the gloom and doom that comes before all this. We need to look into the future that God has promised, the glory that he comes. And so I'm learning in my life when I think prophecy to look at the last chapter, not what comes ahead of the time. God has promised all this. And we'll continue as we look at the last chapters of Isaiah. So, thank you for joining us. I hope this gives you a sense of expectancy more than worry. We're looking at the time when God comes back, when he returns to rule, and Israel returns to God, and we with Israel worship him forever. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to share insights from God's Word.